co-founder of the Center for Education Strategy. Uh, she is based in Delhi. Meeta, of course, advises CXOs across the country on education policies. She's an avid writer, blogger. She writes for the Forbes magazine. She writes for a, a many uh, leading English dailies um, uh, in, in India. We are very fortunate to have both of them join us today to discuss what the, the days leading up to the 100-day milestone for the Modi government has done for the education sector in India. So let's now just go on to the presentation right away. But before that, let me just mention a few housekeeping rules as usual. We will follow a, the usual discussion, poll, chat format today. You, are, you will see a chat window on your screen where I would encourage you to sort of key in things that you would like the panel to address today. We will also intersperse the presentation with some poll questions, which is our way of learning what you have in mind. And then towards the end of the session, we will display an analysis of all your responses to the poll questions. And just for review of the entire session, we will be uploading a recording of this session along with the presentation slides that we are using on our web page from where you can access it at a late date at your convenience. So if you're ready, Lakshmi and Nita, why don't we start with the first? Poll question itself, so we can set a tone of what you expect from this. So here's the first poll question on your screens now. We'll just wait for the questions to pop up on the screen, which is now. What we'd like to know from you is if and when or where does India feature in your scheme of things? Are you already active in India in one form or the other? Or are you looking at it from a long term or a medium term? Or are you not here yet? Please choose one of those answers and click the finish button once you're done. We'll collect the answers in the background and share with you towards the end of the session today. I'll give you a couple of seconds. And for those of you who've completed your voting, please start keying in your questions in the chat window for our expert panel to address as we go, go forward in this, in today's session. Okay, if you're ready, we will, uh, well, I'm told that there are many of you still attempting the questions, so we will give you another couple of seconds. There we are, we have closed that poll. So let us move on to the next question, or the, the first slide in, 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 the, in the webinar today. And here's where I'm gonna invite Meeta Sengupta to start giving her expert inputs. Meeta, I can see a whole lot of your favorite points in there. So let me not add to, to what you are going to say and simply just hand it over to you. Would you like to take us through what the focus areas have been for the government in the run up to these 100 days? Thank you very much, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, exciting times ahead. We are at the beginning of a new journey. We have a long way ahead. There is a steep staircase to climb. And it's only been 85 days of the current government. So in the run up to 100 days, what have we seen so far and what, have, uh, what has gone right? Uh, before we talk about that, I would like to take about half a minute to talk about the expectations. The expectations from this government were massive. We expect change, we expected transformation, and we expected everything that we saw in the run after the election, which was a very professional exercise. The focus on the right areas, grassroots uh, uh, that, that were pulled in, excellent strategy, excellent tactics. What we expected in the first 100 days was communication of that standard, strategizing of that standard, 
tactical intervention of that standard. At this stage, you call me an expert, thank you very much for that, but the experts themselves uh, often find themselves looking for signals from the government. Mm. And we have seen very few of those. What have we seen so far? We have seen that the government is taking its time to understand the issues. And I think one has to respect them for that. One has to say, yes, it is a complex sector. It, it actually talks about every child, every human being, and their progress in life. So this is, it is all right to take some time to understand the complexity. What we have seen is a strong uh, focus on skills. In fact, an entirely new ministry that has been created for skills. What we have seen is focus on employability. Everything that you do has to create employable youth, a pragmatism that we haven't seen so far. Value for everything that you see. Then each time you analyze it, you see that there is a quest for value. And we will talk more about it, I hope. What we've also seen is I'm not sure whether I support this or not, but you have to respect the regulatory compliance that they are insisting upon across the sector. Right or wrong, and we can again talk about that. Um, there is a harking back to heritage, to history, to in fact redefining history. Uh, famously, even on television programs, they have talked about decolonizing textbooks. I don't know uh, how colonial the textbooks are, actually. I must say that some of them, even though they're badly edited, yeah. uh, the content might not be as uh, uh, colonial as they say it is. But this is a trend that we see across um, K-12, across the world. In mm -hmm. fact, even England had had a teacher's revolt in a way, where they were trying to uh, bring in more um, uh, English uh, stories into, into uh, their, their textbooks. But what we're seeing is a very interesting policy to practice connect. Where on the, on the few things that the minister has actually done is, in fact, one of the first things that she did was write to the principals of CBSE school and, and tell them how well they were doing. Yeah. That kind of direct connect yeah. and that kind of appreciation has not been done in the longest time. Yeah. In fact, even after school results uh, uh, were, were out, she actually took the time out to speak to students and connect with them and congratulate them on their achievements. So it is about achievement, it's about creating value, and it's about creating connect so far. Very good, Mito. Thank you very much. Lakshmi, um, what are we hearing from our overseas clients and, and friends? I mean, are they excited about what has happened so far? Uh, were they expecting a lot more, or are they pleasantly surprised? Thank you, uh, You know, Like so many people uh, here in the country, who's looking up to this government to deliver everything in, in a matter of 100 days. Yeah. Uh, I think um, our overseas colleagues also have a lot of expectations um, from the government, mm. just like the citizens of this country. Um, what, uh, are, um, what I hear is that all of them uh, want to know uh, how easy it will be to access uh, uh, students from this market, mm. Um, there is uh, a renewed interest in engaging with India. I have seen that uh, tailing off uh, towards the end of the previous government, uh, but I can see a, a renewed optimism in engaging with, uh, with India. Uh, and uh, obviously, um, for foreign education institutions that want to uh, engage with India, the biggest, uh, you know, the elephant in the room is foreign education providers, the future or or the lack of it, um, of that bill. Yeah. Um, and uh, forgive me for saying this, you know, the 100 days uh, as, as an avid, uh, you know, participant in the higher education space, um, I wanted to see uh, what the government thought about uh, foreign education providers' uh, participation in the, in the big agenda that India has got uh, in the higher education space. Um, and like Nita said, it is, uh, the government has started out slow. And uh, you know it is interesting because this is uh, this was a campaign that was run to perfection uh, by continuously communicating with the uh, with the voters, with the uh, you know with the stakeholders. And uh, suddenly, in the 85 days that they have been here, um, you know things have sort of calmed down. They will only talk to you when they wish to talk to you. Um, so we are all kind of you know uh, gazing into uh, into the you know unknown. Uh, hoping that we will hear a message back uh, 
uh, as to what uh, it is that that is you know holding um, all of this together because we have heard the prime minister um, uh, you know addressing the nation from the ramparts of the uh, red fort uh, asking for uh, you know he is looking at a 10 year mandate so that there is ample time to kind of um, fix all of that is um, ailing our higher education space for want of a better word um, and you know uh, not only the foreign education institutions the citizens of this country people like me and Hita who, who are avid watchers of the sector we are all looking with a lot of hope uh, at this government and particularly um, uh, you know, smoothly run. So cautious optimism? Yes. Sums it up? Yes. More or less? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, that's a good place to start, I'm sure. So uh, let's move on to the next slide and see um, wh how we take that forward. I mean, let's look at what has happened in, in the run-up to these 100 days. Okay. We are picking up a lot of signals from the various quarters of the government, the press, uh, our own contacts in the government. And we are picking up a mixture of these signals. There are, there are some really strong signals uh, where the government has done, or rather taken huge steps in the right, right direction. In some areas it's been lukewarm. In some areas where we thought we would hear a lot of noise, there has been deathly calm. Are you still cautiously optimistic? Well, you know, um, the unfortunate thing is, in the in the run up to these hundred days, yeah. we have had a lot of noise over what I call as non-issues. Yeah. The first one being, um, you know, the qualifications of the individual uh, who has been selected uh, by uh, Mr. Modi uh, to run the Ministry of Human Resources mm -hmm. Development. Now, we have had educationists and lawyers um, heading up uh, MHRP. Yeah. We haven't seen any change. I would rather kind of, you know, give this, uh, you know, the youngest cabinet minister, uh, very articulate, someone who has come up the hard way, uh, you know, having worked her way up, um, uh, you know, give her a chance to, um, uh, you know, uh, to see what it is that she's going to do to the system. So we, uh, we have spent a lot of air time, a lot of news print, um, uh, talking about her qualifications. The second issue, uh, uh, which again, you know, uh, which is a Sad commentary on the state of affairs within our country um, uh, is again, you know, division orientated, uh, wherein we have had um, uh, people uh, taking to the streets about not wanting to, um, uh, uh, you know, write in English uh, in the civil services examination, and the government having had to having to give in to that. Now, this is a government that has come to power, um, uh, promising a better future um, to our uh, uh, to the to the population. As well as you know, it has it holds a promise to the young uh, people in this country. Now to say that you know um, we don't want to engage with uh, the, you know English and as a English as a language of interaction and whatever in a country which has got 22 official languages um, is a you know I don't think it works for me per se because we are if, we, if, the, if the prime minister is calling the world to come and make in India every single thing. You know, we need a population that will operate to world standards, and that is not going to happen in Hindi or Malayalam or Tamil or you know Oriya. You know, it has to happen in the lingua franca of the world. And you know, uh, and English, whether we like it or not, it is an asset that we have got uh, from our colonial yeah. past, yeah. and we should leverage that. We should take advantage of it. Why not? Yeah. yeah. Sure. So that is the second uh, issue that has dominated the headlines. Yeah. So. I, I find our, us kind of getting sucked into, you know, issues, um, non-issues yeah, non -issues really. The third one, obviously, um, a four-year undergraduate uh, program, which was rolled back, uh, and it was, you know, very much an issue that was there in the, um, uh, in the manifesto um, of BJP, at least for the, the Delhi constituency, it was very much there, and that has been rolled back, and that has also created a lot of unwanted noise then we have real serious issues. Very valid points indeed, Lakshmi. Meetup, um, what are your most optimistic takeaways from these 85 odd days? Uh, before the most optimistic takeaways, in fact, 
I uh, would like to go back to the issue that we see as a distraction, uh, the minister's qualifications. Okay. And I see this as an opportunity for change. Uh -huh. I see that this is a lady who is skilled, yet without certification. Mm. She actually embodies the issues of the education sector in India today. And in a sense, this is an invitation to create that pathway between skilling and certification that we as a country must work towards. In fact, I, I would be very happy for her to see a uh, bring in accreditation to prior learning, better certification, better pathways into more formal education. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that she can bring forth from this personal story. So while it has been a distraction so far, and I, it has annoyed many of us who have heard stories of how capable she is as, as an ad administrator, it would be a wasted opportunity if we did not move down this pathway to accreditation and certification. I, I would actually call for that uh, at, at, at this stage. The sad, the other sad thing has been the rollback of the four-year program in Delhi University and the other universities that were running four-year programs, whether they, it, some of them have been running it for many years, they have had to redesign their programs to align with the UGC. Their fourth year now is an optional research year or, or an optional project year. Again, a silver lining here. This is a government that is all about compliance. It says, here are the rules, you'll stick to the rules. That makes for much firmer ground than we have seen in the past 10 years. We know this is where we stand. This is where, what the rules say. This is what we must do, no exception. While I am a supporter of a four-year four program, and I would call for better design of rules, rules that actually answer to the needs of the students, it's not about flouting the rules anymore. And I think this is a strong signal to those of us who want to enter the education sector, uh, the, the friends and, and, and the colleagues that you spoke about who are waiting uh, in the wings because there has been too much uncertainty in the past and I'm hoping that this is one strong signal that says no more uncertainty you know where you stand if you invest these are the rules when you do not invest here are your opportunities I would love to see that uh, in play uh, the third thing that is very optimistic is the investment or at least promises of investment in infrastructure that everything has been about, and well, it does build on work on work that has been done in the past 20 years of that, not just the past 10 years. But you do know that this government is serious about taking broadband to the villages. It is serious about taking electricity to the villages. Its first step in higher education, in fact, has been uh, creating uh, e-libraries. This is a project that's been on the cards for the longest time, it's show, it's been brought up as a priority. There, there are other programs that have been announced as, as well. Um, there is much to look forward to here. Excellent. So I, I can feel the optimism building up now all of a sudden. So let's hope this guys so, throughout the session and our, our audience can feel that optimism building up. So let's let's go on to the next slide now. Um, what have the achievements been, for example? Where, where, are, where, where is time being spent most? We've been, I mean, since the manifesto has been published, for example, uh, the BJP, uh, the, the leading party of the government, uh, or this, uh, the government today, has been talking about virtual schools, uh, e-learning, MOOCs, of course, and everything to do with information and communication technology, or ICT, taking education to every nook and corner of this country. And I think we've been only hearing more and more good news on that side. Do you agree, Mita? Is that what you, you're sensing as well? I think one of the challenges of education and education technology in India is the fact that we have almost all, always transferred technology without seeking it in, to embed it in the context. Uh -huh. And I think the first announcement for the higher education sector, the Swayam platform for MOOCs, is a very good first step in creating contextualized learning for the higher education sector. 
I am actually, uh, I was torn when I, when I um, heard of the uh, assignment. I mean, what's new about it? It's about the same professors delivering across same class, the same platform. Not really. It is about creating context. And this works all the way down from the higher education sector, all the way down to uh, the K-12 and even early years. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously has implications for those who are trained. And this again comes back to the higher education sector. Who are trained to deliver for results and for scale all the way down to uh, to early years learning. The new policy on early years learning is almost on its way. It's about to be notified very soon. So you can see movement and dynamism in a more practicable format and a more practicable uh, platform. Colleges that will have Wi-Fi. That's still planned. But nothing has happened so far. We're hoping that this will happen very, very soon. He's actually put dates on it. What's, what's, what's fantastic now is, and what's interesting, is that you are actually trying to speak to the last mile, mm -hmm. the grassroots, the yes. people who voted for it. Yes. This has not been part of many discussions, policy discussions so far. Policy now actually extends and talk to the student and talks about the student and how they will access learning. Good point. So let me, I mean, this is going to be of great interest to our audience as well. And, uh, you know, we will be receiving a lot of requests from our uh, foreign university clients, especially on uh, the opportunities that ICT, e learning, e libraries, etc., present for partnership. Yes. Okay. There have been hurdles and barriers in the past, but are you now sensing a renewed sense of optimism here as well? Yes. And no. Ah. Yeah. Uh, yes, in the sense that our, um, you know, the Viber client base is actively reaching out to us, asking about um, e-learning uh, opportunities uh, in the country, uh, and how they can kind of participate uh, in that emerging opportunity. The evidence suggests that um, India uh, contributes the largest uh, number of participants with respect to Coursera. Um, so you have, uh, you know, you already have a large number of people who are familiar with MOOCs and who use MOOCs to um, uh, uh, add to their, uh, you know, arsenal. Yes. But the problem is that, you know, we still haven't, you know, we don't know. I mean, and I, I think that is a problem that the whole wide world is grappling with, which is credentializing yes. of all of these MOOCs. But from an Indian perspective, that has got a, a wider relevance. Primarily because even the so-called institutions of national importance and the new colleges, etc., that we are creating in the back of beyond for uh, for bringing in development into the you know the, the farther uh, ends of the country, they are struggling with attracting good quality um, faculty members, and um, this is a way forward. You know the national knowledge network. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the fiber optic network yeah. that we have uh, created uh, and, uh, you know, even the SWAM, um, uh, you know, these are all tools that we can use to make sure that um, uh, the students are, um, uh, you know, learning to uh, uh, reasonably good standards um, and there are opportunities to participate in this kind of opportunity, you know, in this kind of, um, uh, you know, sector that is emerging with respect to um, uh, e-learning, um, uh, uh, e-learning. But th the point is that, you know, um, uh, with India, it's always been that people, you know, uh, for anything that is, you know, in the virtual environment, mm -hmm. they, would, they wouldn't want to pay as much as they would pay for a face-to-face -face education, yes. even if it is of very low, very poor quality. Yes. So that has always been a, a problem that uh, we have had. Um, having said that, I do remain very optimistic because even in the budgets uh, that got announced um, a, a few weeks ago, the government has set aside a substantial amount of money to have virtual classrooms, etc. So uh, this is a prime minister who has, you know, who really realized and, you know, utilized the power of social media. So uh, has got a very good awareness of what it can do. Um, and I'm hoping to see that being translated into the higher education. Excellent. I mean, we touched upon uh, the language issue. What about MOOCs? Will English still be the, uh, the lingua franca for MOOCs? Will it help 
education per se reach down to the grassroots level or will there be uh, bilingual programs or even vernacular programs? I think the, you know, um, there are opportunities for um, programs that are in vernacular mm -hmm. languages. See, it is a reality that we have to live with. Uh, India uh, is a land of polyglots. Um, we will not have, you know, that uniformity. No. All of us, most of us suffer from mother tongue influence when we speak uh, the language. Having said that, um, there is a sizable uh, number of uh, people mm. who will uh, who will want to access um, material um, in their own uh, local language yes. um, uh, and would also want to kind of you know improve their English language uh, skills. Yes. So um, uh, there is an opportunity in the in the vernacular MOOCs. Yes. Um, uh, but for the wider, you know, if you look at it from a, an employer perspective, mm. there is um, uh, there is need to have uh, credentialized MOOCs that are in, in English. So Mita, you, you raised a very good, uh, very interesting point about recognition of prior learning, for instance. And you gave a very interesting example of our minister, who can be a role model in this one. So where do you see MOOCs and e-learning, distance learning? I mean, by the way, uh, just, just to mention, of course, India is home to the Indira Gandhi National Local University one of the largest in the world for distance learning programs. So what next for you? Can IGNO take on the MOOC mantle as well or has to be a, a totally different entity? It's interesting that you mention IGNO, the, the National Open University, because when we spoke to them about MOOCs, they said, oh, we've been doing that for the past 20 years. What's ah, new about this? Interesting. We have this technology. But IGNO itself is going through a transition right, right. now. It's, it, is going, it is going through a restructuring, both in terms of its governance processes and in terms of what it will deliver. Uh, the, the news currently isn't very good, but that obviously is uh, the, the process of Schumpeterian uh, creative destruction. <laughs> we are trying to create something that is better and bigger than, than, than what, what we have. The good news is we have the platform already. We have the network, we have the outreach. So we have the distribution network. Even more interesting, the edutech players. So far, many of them have simply providers to, as education technology has worked as education technology providers to international markets. Yes. For the first time, they are emerging as entrepreneurs in their own right, uh -huh. trying to serve the emerging market in India. The faith in Indian, the Indian market as a paying market is seen in the rise of these entrepreneurs. Uh -huh. And, and uh, you have uh, people actually now uh, have businesses reviewing their, their work with 200 to 500 uh, providers uh, actually competing with each other for, for the ruby, for the Indian ruby. So this is a vibrant market, a clear uh, market that is accessible to everybody. Uh, when you speak of language, I think there are again two aspects to it. One, we are polyglots, as you rightly say. So we have the opportunity to create multilingual courses. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we have worked very hard in the past few years. We actually have the scripts ready, the technology ready. We have all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle ready to be able to deliver much more substance than merely a transliterated MOOC could have delivered. So again, it is an opportunity for co-creation uh, over here. Thirdly. MOOCs will actually have the opportunity to work in the skills sector and you uh, pointed uh, towards the accreditation of prior learning or skills. MOOCs have a major role to play in that and many of these skills are actually beyond language. We, we know of MOOCs that can, that can speak to plumbers, to electricians, to accountants who merely need to demonstrate their skills or learn by watching and doing. It's up to us to design the right technology that reaches out to them and helps them bring proof of their skills to a certification that is actually valued in the in the employer's market. Excellent. So uh, just as an add-on uh, to, to what I just uh, mentioned before, so let's stick to the MOOCs, for example. Should this be driven by business, which looks for a profit at the end of the day, or should it be an exclusive domain of the government? Mita, what do you say? I think it's very clear that the business of government is to govern. 
they are not in the business of doing things. They are in the business of making sure that they watch over things and make sure that things are done right. That has been one of the promises. Better governance has been one of the election promises and one of the largest slogans. The government is actually doing what it's supposed to do. It is saying that we will provide you with Wi-Fi, we will provide you with electricity, we will provide you with the infrastructure to be able to do what you need to do. The content is up to you. The delivery is up to you. Finding business models, whether it is business for profit or business not for profit, as it has to be legally yeah. in, in most of the sector, yeah. not all of it again, uh, this, that, that is entirely up to you. We will make sure that the top end and the bottom end are in place for you. That is the promise so far. And that is what we are looking forward to. Oh, excellent. So, luckily, there seems to be a business model here. Would that be another reason for optimism? Yes, and I think, you know, uh, MOOCs yeah. um, with respect to kind of, you know, whether we will become acceptable, mm. business houses will have a huge role to play because they are the recipients of all of these individuals with different qualifications. Yeah. yeah, they are the ones who are paying for their skills. Right. Yeah, the day um, and in India we have seen um, that the return on uh, investment is a big angle for anyone yes. who um, you know who goes after chasing after qualification, whether it's an Indian qualification or whether it is a foreign qualification. Now. With respect to MOOCs, the day we see that uh, someone in the industry is willing to pay a premium for uh, an individual um, who has got a qualification that has been exclusively taken as a result of a MOOC, then that will be the game changer. So industries, business houses will have a huge role to play in, uh, in this whole uh, MOOCs uh, scenario. I think we'll be doing a separate session on books very soon. Yes. <coughs> so yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I add a little yes, bit to, of to, to that? Yes. I mean, it's not just about books. I, I, I'd like to commend Lakshmi for bringing out the point on value. Value investment, value purchase is a part of the Indian ethos. Mm -hmm. That is something that they will look for not just in uh, Indian degrees, not just in foreign degrees, but also in professional qualifications. So one of the trends that we have seen in the Indian market is management and engineering schools that have had to shut down recently yes. because they have not been able to deliver value. Yeah. And how do you test for value? You do not test for it by simply noting whether they have received a certificate or not. You do not test for value by the number of hours they have uh, worked. Yeah. You do not test for it by uh, uh, how many uh, projects you did. No, you test for it in the market by placements. Yes. How much is employer willing to pay for it? And that is what is going to drive the education market. Where you see value, there, there will be a market. Where you can create value, there will be a market for it. But if you cannot create value, then there isn't a business model. That's what you see. Very valid point, Lisa. I, uh, I also want to add something here. Yes. Um, from what we have heard uh, from um, people who are interacting with different ministers, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of them are telling you know individuals that they are meeting that if you have a qualification, yeah. um, you know, that will result in an employment yeah. opportunity at the end of it. Yeah. Please come to me. I have money to give. Absolutely, very yeah. valuable. Yeah. And uh, that, and, and you know, this is a prime minister who looks at education through the lens of skilling. Um, it's all about kind of you know making people more employable. Yes. And uh, uh, MOOCs is one of the ways to kind of help mm -hmm. upskill people. Uh, that is not the starting point. I really don't think so at this stage. Um, but employability is critical um, for Indian players, Certainly. and it will increasingly become an important piece uh, in the you know in, in the whole engagement model that foreign education providers also have with India. Uh, that's going to open up the Indian market. Yeah, because you know, see, the, uh, there is huge internal consumption, true, right? True. And we don't have enough avenues um, uh, to kind of create individuals who are skilled to take care of that internal consumption. Yeah, from start to finish. Yes. You know, whether it, you know sectors like retail, um, uh, uh, you know, even uh, any any sector you take. There is a requirement for highly skilled individuals, yeah, okay. and and at different levels, yes, and um, 
and you know they will all find jobs mm. because you know we are uh, you know 1.2 billion people and we have all sorts of needs yeah so very valid point yes um, i'm sure everyone's sensing the excitement in the room i mean we are we are really talking about uh, like you said a huge market both for the traditional you know classroom based education right up to MOOCs, which are traditionally considered free of payment. Yes. But let us see how that model evolves in India. I'm sure India will surprise the world uh, as it has in, in, in every, other, every other field. So um, let's see, uh, let's move to the next uh, slide and uh, it will come up on your screen now. So program design. So here's a question. In fact, while we were discussing the, the slide deck before we went on air, uh, we thought this is a good question to pose to our audiences, right, Nita? We said uh, we wanted to find out from the audience what is the real problem that you, as education providers, are trying to address in India. Nita, maybe we should come back to you to, to start this point off. Absolutely, I'm happy to do that. Uh, that that is precisely the point. So far, education has been seen as a traditional black box. You enter the black box, you, you are processed within the black box and you exit. <laughs> I think it is time for this to change. But change in ways that are ex that bring credibility. Which which is a very interesting challenge for those of us who design education programs and, and uh, intervention design and program design is, is one of the one of my uh, passions I would say. Uh, and, and I do that with a with a will uh, with a, so what is the challenge that is being set for us? We've already discussed value. We know that what we are really seeking is value. What does that mean? It means that for every student, for the people that you are actually talking to, you are going to give them enough value that will create employability. The demographics are such that at this stage, we, India has to focus on employability. And when we say employability, it is not just about employability in one sector or within the country, it is about global employability. So the when we say employability, we are also saying global standards. We are not talking about standardization, and I'm very particular about this. We are talking about achieving global standards, mobility. That is what we are trying to deliver. What else are you trying to deliver? You are definitely trying to deliver a certain degree of compliance. What happens within the black box cannot just be purely innovative. That is something that we have seen does not work with this particular government. They are quite particular about making sure that compliance with a certain process is uh, adhered to. They, just, they want their people to be on firm ground. If you create a certificate, you are creating it for credibility. Compliance is an essential for credibility. What value we have spoken about. But the more interesting thing is here we are talking about outreach. We are talking about making sure that these skills reach not just those who have been able to participate in MOOCs, not just those who have been able to access universities in urban areas. We are talking about new universities that have been set up for agriculture. We are talking about a more federal view of education. Education that has that, that reaches more people in ways that is meaningful to them. So in that sense, we are talking about creating product design and business models in education that are far more pragmatic than they have been so far. It is also consequently about reaching a much wider audience and a much, much larger market than we have ever said so far. Bang on. So here is the next question, Danita. For example, if you're talking about a global standard, uh, a qualification which is portable, which is mobile across the world. Can a country of India's size, uh, can, can we do it all by ourselves? Or do we do this in partnership with, let's say, institutions or even nations that have undergone this process uh, many, many years ago? I ever, if you have the opportunity, to seek partnerships, if you have the opportunity to work with those who are able to bring standards to the table, those who are able to bring good governance to the table, who are able to bring their own experience to the table, having been through this cycle, why ever not? I think it is actually time for co-creation of 
new qualifications. I think it is time for not to do the traditional technology transfer, which is what we have seen across industry, which is what we have seen across education. What we have done so far, even in terms of education technology that has been brought to schools and universities, is we have picked up units of, of or modules and we have tried to deliver them in a context that does, and that does not work. What we have an opportunity for now is to work together in, in a true partnership where we understand the needs of the market, we understand our strengths as providers, and we create a model that is strong, sustainable, and delivers value to every stakeholder. And when I say every stakeholder, I am talking about a fair return to every stakeholder uh -huh. in this. Uh -huh. Not commercialization, uh -huh. not profiteering, uh -huh. but a fair return to the investment that you put in. The sheer size of the market that is available to you over here, who will co-create with you, who will participate in growth and dissemination of, of what you are building. It's, it's a whole new adventure. It's a fantastic journey that we can begin at, at this stage. So, who is going to pay for this session? See, one of the um, challenges that um, foreign institutions that have come into India, yeah. uh, you know, in terms of wanting to participate in this you know, education-related agenda as well as the skills agenda, mm -hmm. is that you know they have struggled with the price points. Yeah. Yeah. You are trying to transplant something that has worked very well mm -hmm. in your country mm -hmm. under what I would call controlled circumstances. Here it is, you know, we live, we thrive in chaos. Everything is so chaotic. Uh, you are talking of, you know, catering to um, hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you are talking of a model that would have probably catered to a few thousands back then in your country. And uh, you know, and there you are, you, know, you are talking of a certain standard of living and uh, a wage minimum, etc., etc., which will all add up to your overheads, and you are delivering education at a particular price. True. When it comes to India, your model has to be scalable. Your model has to be flexible to accommodate, you know, all of these. You know, uh, we were joking just before we went on this uh, webinar that we need to have a backup of a backup, you know, and all of us <laughs> sort of agreed. Because in India, you have to be prepared for the unknown. And, um, you know, this happens with a lot, many of us who are in education, and I am guilty of the same. We all like to have a certain structure and a controlled environment yeah. to be able to operate. And in India, it just doesn't work. And uh, price point being the bane of a lot of those initiatives that people really want to uh, do in country. Yeah and are not able to uh, find the sweet spot for it. There is funding available, but then there are a lot of, uh, you know, ifs and buts and also outcomes that are attached to um, getting those funds released that it scares away people, yeah. Um, uh, but those limited models that have been successful have been those that have kind of really looked at innovative ways of creating modules yeah. Um, at price yeah. points that are attractive to uh, individuals, the point. The point. Yeah? yeah, whether they are single you, single qualification or certifications, mm -hmm. and which you can accumulate over a period of time, etc., etc. So uh, scalable uh, value qualifications are what India needs um, uh, for you know those institutions that really want to actively participate. In the in the you know the domestic environment, yeah. there will always be a, a group of individuals who will leave the country to study abroad mm -hmm. and who will take a large majority of them take education loans etc etc and they would you know pursue a qualification at the price point that you know the the, the country demands. True. But in within India, there is a sizable population that can't afford that. True. Uh, but they have the aspirations. Yeah, you go to any shopping mall today. Oh yes. You will see these hordes and hordes of young people, you know, walking uh, in the midst of the sea of all these brands that some large majority yeah. of them probably cannot afford, yeah, sure. but would want to buy it and acquire at some stage. And that is that that is the route that you are kind of you know this education the entire education system. If we can sort that out, 
he channelizes the uh, you know the aspirations of these individuals to a better lifestyle you know to, to better paying capacity yeah. etc etc mm -hmm. so um, you know with respect to how foreign education institutions in, engage with india i would say that you know come with the idea of you know having a scalable value model otherwise you know it will soon turn into a nightmare and a, and it's a disappointment oh, i agree Ladies and gentlemen, you can see that we can talk about these points for the rest of the night or the day, depending on which part of the world you are in. But in, in, in fair interest of time, we will have to pick up pace. So let's quickly jump over, jump over to the next slide, uh, which is going to be a poll quest. So uh, we would now like to hear your opinion on this question. So please, as you did for the first poll question, vote on what are the key changes that you as education providers would like to see in India over the next five years? And there are four options. Please choose the most suitable uh, for you. Will it be clarity on regulations? Will it be about recognition of foreign qualifications in India? Will it be government initiatives involving overseas academic partners? Or will it simply be university to university partnership in the private sector? So we'd like to hear uh, what you have to say about these. Uh, we'll give you some time to complete your voting. There's a countdown going on now. Thank you very much uh, for your response there. We're collating the answers and we'll display them towards the end of this session. So let's go on to the next slide then. Now, very interesting slide and in which we have spent a considerable amount of time uh, discussing and, and evaluating what our responses should be. But again, we will have to sum the whole thing up in less than less than five minutes, literally. So let me just quickly ask Mita. Mita, of course, questions around you mentioned that education in India cannot be a profiteering business. It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be uh, rather and a large heartedness of a noble government. profession. A noble profession, very well put, of course, a noble profession. But um, at the end of the day, everybody wants to see at least their costs met. Is that is that where the business of education going to in India, or is there something better? Absolutely. I mean, uh, there is, as I said, a very very large uh, private sector, and even within higher education. The, the new private sector universities have far more freedom mm -hmm. to operate than uh, the, the state or central mm -hmm. universities have. So uh, um, one of the things that everybody talks about is faculty, for example. Where yes. do you find the faculty to, uh, to feed the very large number of students? 800 mm -hmm. new universities we need yeah. in the next few years, yeah. I believe. Yes. yes. So where do you find the faculty for that? And can the government do that alone? Uh, Not yeah. necessarily. Now, while the central government uh, and the state government universities, central and state universities have restrictions, and that is definitely part of the negotiation that they are having with uh, their, their providers, private universities actually have the ability to pay faculty at global rate. Sure. The IITs, for example, and those are mentioned in uh, the dispatches uh, uh, that, that are sent out to every uh, global ranking of universities uh, happens, they, they, they score fairly high in the Indian rankings globally, of course, we, there's a lot more work to be done. They are now able to pay their faculty a lot more. They have much more funding uh, available for their, their laboratories. The uh, IISC, which was recently in the news because they had to roll back a part of their four-year program, has a vast number of collaborations. Their laboratories have been renewed. And each of these is about creating a, a better application. Of, of science. Yeah. Every one of their new investments has been about creating better application. When we say application, we are necessarily and logically talking about a market for it or a use mm -hmm. for it. Anything that has a use has value, therefore has a market. Mm -hmm. So while traditional education is still seen as a public good, mm -hmm. the innovative models that we, we are creating and the models that we create on the sites are actually fairly in fact, I use the word fair with care. They, they, they are 
quite fair to their providers. If you are in the business of providing good content, you will be paid fairly. If you are in the business of providing a good platform, you will be paid fairly. Mm. If you are in the business of running a school, you may have restrictions on the fees that you can charge unless you can justify higher fees. So there are clear regulations and clear indications on where there is value for the, for the business person and where there are restrictions for a business person. The, I have worked a lot with budget private schools in the last three to four, four years and while that is in the K-12 um, uh, segment, mm -hmm. they have had a huge uh, a number, amount of trouble with regulations mm -hmm. where the new regulations need teachers to be paid a particular amount. The government has been open to negotiation. See, this is, this is the interesting thing. Regulations are not set in stone. Regulations are designed to serve the student. And this is a clear signal that we have received in the last 85 days. It is about the last mile. It is about the last student. If the student cannot access that learning because the regulatory model is wrong, I'm sure it is possible to have a reasonable dialogue about it. And that is the journey ahead of us. We need to be able to present the case. Let me ensure you are the part of all these questions. All our institutional partners will be coming to you to help define a business model for India. What, what is, I mean, have we already answered the question or is there something else? You know, uh, it's interesting uh, to listen to Nita um, talking consistently about this last mile productivity yeah. and your, you know, the end user. Mm. In the last 10 years, mm. the maximum expansion in terms of the hiring has happened in the private sector. Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. Our public sector has been hampered, um, uh, you know, they have literally been lame duck um, uh, because they have been hemmed in by a lot of uh, rules, regulations, they don't have the autonomy to take decisions. They have struggled with vacancies, uh, you know, uh, for example, just in uh, Delhi University, you are talking of over 1,600, uh, you know, odd vacancies um, that are yet to be filled, you know, so uh, lack of uh, faculty members, um, uh, obviously affirmative action, um, inability to pay, um, uh, you know, the market price to get a really good faculty member, for example, you know, so there are a lot of issues. Uh, uh, that have you know that are not in you know favor of the public sector. Having said that, the private sector um, uh, there are all sorts of you know there are different shades of uh, players, mm -hmm. fifty shades of private mm -hmm. uh, sector players. Uh -huh. uh, but um, having said that, uh, there are there is a fantastic work that is happening in the private sector. Mm -hmm. People who have a genuine passion for education have ventured into it, but. The private sector does feel that it is the, the, the child of a lesser god, yeah. Um, um, and you know, the, the, I have I had the opportunity to listen to a lot of people who have come uh, uh, and uh, and really want to engage uh, with the education agenda of the country, but they do it through the private sector. Now, um, the government, like Nita said, the the government is here to govern. They have to build the backbone by building the infrastructure. If you want somebody to go and set up a university in the back of beyond, mm -hmm. build good roads. Absolutely. Yeah. Build good schools so that young faculty members with families can go in and you know teach in those right. institutions. You know, there should be opportunities for you know the the, the wives or you know wives to go and work because large majority of them don't. I mean, you know, we want to work. You know, to, in today's time and age. They don't have the opportunity, so young faculty members will think 100 times before taking up an opportunity that comes in the back of beyond institution. Point. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is that the government, uh, in, there is a business in yes. model in, in education mm -hmm. and that model, you know, you can see in the private sector who are, um, because there is a hunger for good quality education in the middle of India. Yeah? And what Mr. Modi is trying to do is to push down that aspiration another you know two three layers down you know because there is a huge population there middle class India is one layer yes. yeah? and that middle class knows that you know it wants to have a good education the next two three layers yeah. are you know awakening to that sure. and the government 
is trying you know government has to kind of create that infrastructure and give sufficient autonomy to higher education players uh, for them to determine their curriculum and uh, you know to deliver you know how how they want to deliver all that the government needs to do is to create the quality framework within which these can uh, operate yeah. and to quickly add to that not just higher education or k12 i think this is it's time for post k12 or post secondary yes. education as well to play a role when you say it is about creating something for the middle class the middle zone between school and higher education too needs structures support it needs that backbone of governance from from the uh, new government yes. to be able to deliver value to the individuals who need it yes. So this, this is that's another point for the next webinar, autonomy in the higher education. Uh, well, we will come back to it. Um, again, we're running short of time, so we have to just quickly go on to the next uh, slide. Uh, and we, we did talk about addressing a few points in this slide, at least, Meeta. So uh, over to you, we want to know about uh, foreign investment in India. Is that something uh, which people are taking up or warming up to? Uh, one bit of good news for those of us who watch uh, the sector is um, we keep talking about the foreign education providers bill yeah. and currently it has lapsed because the previous government was not able to take it through parliament. The good news is that the new government has already declared its intent to allow foreign investment in significant areas of infrastructure and even defense and that's a daring move. Yes. So if you have investment in defense, the signal is very strong. The investment in education will be welcome. That is fairly clear to all of us. Now it is up to us who wish to invest from other countries into the Indian market to create what we used to call global models. Yes. The ones with global reach but with local relevance. The challenge now is, is, is up to us to be ready for when that regulation comes. So far, I'm not sure we're ready. The challenge is also about redefining our markets. So far we have talked about urban markets, we have talked about extending uh, partnerships with, with other uh, providers. Uh, we, it may not, it's not as scary as it looks. We, we do deal in chaos, but it's not as scary as it looks. It, it, it's a very resilient uh, market that we are talking about. So it, I think it's time to invest in understanding the market better. It is very clearly, ultimately, about feeding the need. You don't create a need as a provider. You identify a pain point, you identify the need and you feed that. I think it is time for foreign investment in education and foreign providers to invest in finding that market and finding that need. Go where the need is. Very, very interesting point, Mita. We'll come back uh, for a third round of discussions with you on that one. Uh, plenty more to go, but I think we'll have to just uh, go, on, go on to the the last poll, um, question number three coming on your screen now. Uh, as we approach the close of the webinar, let's quickly ask you, what would your preferred mode of engagement with India be? You've heard our experts share their points of view on all these. So uh, would, you, would you prefer to work in the K-12 space or just the student recruitment in the higher education space, in research and partnership? Uh, transnational education or distance e-learning MOOCs or ICT based education. Let's please have your response. And after this we are sharing the outcome of all the three questions that you, you were pulled on and we will see what your collective responses have been. Give you a couple of seconds more. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think we have closed that poll. Uh, and that, of course, logically brings us. We wait for the next slide to come up. And that is the first question that we asked you whether or not India features in your timelines. Uh, just about 40% of you are already active in India. Some of them have medium term 4% and 16% uh, of, of, of the respondents have said that you have long term plans for India. Very interesting indeed and uh, nobody in the audience, not in India yet, everybody is in here in some shape or, or size 
which is very very encouraging let's look at the next one question number two so we know that there is interest in india from every quarter so in the next five years what are the key changes split verdict i must say um, Quarter of you say that you want to see government initiatives involving OC's academic partners. Is that a word of confidence in the government? I would like to think so. Yeah. And then equally divided uh, are the, well, there is always this question on clarity of regulations and the recognition for foreign qualifications in India. And a small minority, which I'm personally surprised about, uh, yeah, a small percent of our audience wants to see more changes in university to university partnership in the private sector. Yeah. We live and learn, we learn. It's okay. Okay. And the, the last question we asked, we wanted to see uh, your responses to that as well. Let's see which sectors uh, do you want to participate in? Um, of course, not surprising, nobody in schools because uh, you, you are all higher education service providers. A quarter of you, hmm. Mita, that warrants a comment, doesn't it? Wants to be in the transnational education space in India. Want to set up campuses, deliver local programs locally. Does that surprise you? It pleases me. Excellent. It pleases me immensely. Excellent. That precisely is the fair education. Mm. Beautiful. Lakshmi, student recruitment, a few percent. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm quite happy to see the. The break. Break. Yeah, yeah, the breakup yeah, yeah, across, yeah. you know, uh, other than K to 12, yeah. I, mean, I, I wasn't expecting yeah. much there. Yeah. But that, you know, people are, you know, considering student recruitment or such, yeah. and, uh, you know, research partnerships, mm. funds, T&E. So, uh, and also distance learning. It is quite interesting because uh, my closing comment would be that, you know, yeah. India yeah. should just not be looked upon as the source country. There is a lot more to yes. India than just being, you know, the, the giver of students to all of these foreign That's institutions. It. It. There are, you know, homegrown institutions that are ambitious, yeah. that are looking for opportunities to collaborate. Um, and, you know, there is uh, good quality research happening in yeah. the pockets. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 there, there is a lot going on here. Yes. And uh, there are opportunities for a multifaceted, multi strand yeah. Uh, engagement uh, with India and on that would be my closing remark. Well said. I mean, I think it just leaves me with one last comment. Uh, of course, uh, incomplete without thanking our participants from across the globe. I know, I mean, I'm looking at one question, for example, in the window that says, um, yeah, poll questions are restrictive sometimes because there are only a limited number of options that we can offer. But that doesn't indicate the, an exhaustive list of options that are available to you. By all means, please reach out to us over email, over, over social media, on, on whatever it is that you wanted to discuss with us and whatever you thought was otherwise restrictive in those polls. Please come back to us. We'll be happy to address those points or take those two people and quarters that can address those questions uh, best for you. Um, I also have to thank both Lakshmi and Nita who have taken this time out and to share their expertise with us. Um, it is late in the evening in India, we are approaching supper time. Um, and uh, thank you very much and we hope to see uh, most of you or even more of you in, in future sessions. And uh, I can see one more question coming in. Uh, it, it, the question, I'm just going to read it out to the, to the panels, panelists here. Is the push on MOOCs to satisfy increased access in remote areas? If so, is there any indication on priorities for major towns and cities? Uh, Nita, that's your expertise. Yes and no. The, a large part of the conversation about cities now has been about smart cities. Yeah. And digital learning is going to be a very, very large part of it. Uh, I'm hoping to actually have a conversation with all of you here at, at, at Sanam about how we bring that uh, to, to fruition. Yeah. And uh, uh, certainly there is a, a very um, clear uh, investment that is going to go into 100 cities. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a policy that is emerging as we speak. In the next 20 or 30 days, we should see far more structure uh, to it. 
So the, the policies and the direction and the kind of courses and the kind of education that we have in rural areas yeah. will be slightly different from what we expect in these digital cities. Yes. Um, um, also, sorry, one last uh, one little thing about it: the digital literacy program. Yeah. And uh, that that engages urban areas before it engages rural areas and engages them in different ways is something that we should. Uh, and pay also, to. one point that the prime minister uh, mentioned uh, in his um, uh, speech. Um, uh, on August 15th was about model villages. He has kind of, you know, asked, challenged. Yes, yes, cha yes challenged he's us. thrown a gauntlet yes. at his, uh, you know, MPs, yeah. saying that uh, use your funds yeah. to, you know, adopt yeah. one village in your constituency and make it a modern village. Right. And, uh, you know, what better way to showcase a village yeah. than through a, a digital literacy um, yes. program yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, uh, making sure that. Um, the, the, the citizens of that village are connected to yeah. the, the whole wide world through the internet. Very, very so, you know, the future looks really yeah. interesting and bright, if you ask me. I'm glad that the optimism has carried through the session. Uh, and I can see that we're still bubbling with energy. We can go on for, for a couple of hours at least. But thank you, everyone, each one of you, for, for logging in and joining us in this very interesting session. Uh, I am now of, of even more firm belief that India is the flavor of the world. All eyes are on, on India. Uh, we, as Indians, we're really, really happy that you are with us, partnering us every way, every step of our, of our journey. And we look forward to welcoming you to India whenever you're here. Please call on us. We are available to discuss uh, your business options with you. Thank you very much and have a good day, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.